Hello everyone and welcome to Journey to Success Radio, a show featuring people and companies who are making a positive contribution to the world. This show will help you learn how to apply success principles in every area of your life so that you can make the most out of your skills and talents and accomplish more of your goals. To find out more about the show, please visit www.journeytosuccessradio.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to Success Radio. My name is Colin Gilmartin, and I am a Napoleon Hill Foundation Certified Instructor in Training, and I am the the lead dream trainer here today. Um, Just to tell you a little bit about myself, uh, the passion to make a difference has been building in me for 18 years, but it wasn't until all of my senses were fired up that I became one with purpose. I have been coaching kids for a while, but never really finding my acres of diamonds, as Russell Conwell so eloquently said. Mixing my dream of inspiring a child with Napoleon Hill's law of success, and you have what one of my seven-year-old students said, it's like having gummy worms for dinner. DreamChainingBook.com came out yesterday and was a bestseller, Amazon bestseller in two categories, Child Activities Book and also self-esteem and self-respect. And today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Hank Weisinger, Ph.D., is trained in clinical counseling and organizational psychology. He is the author of several successful books, including the New York Times bestseller, Nobody's Perfect, and the senior author of a recent New York Times bestseller, Performing Under Pressure, The Science of Doing Your Best When It Matters Most. He has consulted and conducted workshops to dozens of Fortune 500 companies, government agencies, taught numerous business school executive education programs, and executive MBA programs, including Wharton, UCLA, Cornell, NYU, Penn State, and Columbia. Dr. Weisinger has appeared on over 500 television and radio shows, including the Today Show, Good Morning America, Oprah, ESPN, and NPR. He is currently helping uh, uh, helping your kids handle pressure, giving your sons and daughters life's ultimate edge, soon to be an online course in addition to the online version of Performing Under Pressure. Dr. Weisinger, welcome to the show. Hey, good to be speaking with you. Really excited about this. Tell me tell me a little bit about uh, about what you're working on right now. Well, the the... I'm working really in the area of uh, handling pressure, whether it is pressure uh, in a work environment and whether it is pressure in the in the family. And as you mentioned, I just had my recent book, Performing Under Pressure, and now I'm working one uh, which I think is going to have a very wide application uh, called Helping Your Kids Handle Pressure. And I like to think of that as the... The, as the ultimate edge in uh, in life, so I am very excited, especially with what is going on in the college environment. Students are under more pressure than ever before, and uh, student uh, counseling services are overwhelmed. Uh, they don't necessarily have the resources, and yet it is only getting worse. And I actually found a study that was done in. Um, China by a psychologist at Michigan and one from McGill University on academic pressure in China. I have to tell you, it's worse there than it is here. Wow. Where does this, where does this pressure come from? Well, I think there, you know, I think there's a lot of different types of, of uh, sources of pressure. Uh, I think a lot of times we put it on ourselves. You know, let, let's step back and define what a pressure moment is. And, and I would define that as a situation in which you have something at stake and the outcome is dependent on your performance. This, this is so like taking a test or going right. for a job interview or giving a presentation. And one of the revelations that I discovered in doing research for performing under pressure is that um, nobody really does better in a pressure situation, not even Michael Jordan. 
you know, the myth is that people will rise to the occasion. It is actually just the opposite, that pressure downgrades our cognitive success tools, uh, it, uh, meaning our judgment, decision-making, memory. It bends our ethics. Uh, think of cheating. Why do smart kids cheat? If they're so smart, why don't they figure out the answer? And I would say that is because of, of pressure. And it also impacts our psychomotor skills. How many times have you seen a movie where a person is so scared that they can't even open up the uh, lock to their house or the, they fumble with the keys? So if I wanted uh, to personify pressure, I would say point one is I want everybody listening to realize that it is clearly a villain in your life. It does not help you. Nobody thrives under pressure. They might thrive under a challenge or an opportunity, but nobody ever comes home from work and says, gee, I wish I was under more pressure at work. I, I've never heard a kid say or complain to his parents, gee, I wish I was under more pressure at, um, you know, at school. So it is something that is really a villain, and it impacts us in very negative ways. And the idea of the book is to give people strategies of how they can minimize the negative effect. You know, the idea of doing better than your best uh, makes no sense. A C student is never going to rise to the occasion and get 1,600 on their SATs. But many times the A student will, quote, choke uh, meaning that they perform below their capabilities when they want to do their best. And that is the result of the pressure of the moment. That's a, that's a fantastic uh, assessment. Um, and that's something that, you know, I've been coaching soccer for 20 years, and I see. I wanted to just ask you, can I? is pressure the same as, as competition? Well, where do you think very, those two you know, words that come is into a great, play? That is a great question because every CEO will give the talk to this sales force, you know, we've got to be competitive and beat the other guy. And you hear that in uh, sports all the time. Competition yeah. is a natural pressure inducer. You know, where do you think yeah. the phrase do or die came from that we hear or in sport tournaments like, you know, March Madness? You know, what do you think the first competitive event for man was? What was the very first competition for man? Probably survival. Okay, so here we are. We're back in the times, and there's a piece of meat, and there's only enough for one person. Now, how do you think they settle who gets that piece of meat? Do you think they're going to see who can throw a stone the furthest? Do you think they're going to see who can climb a tree the fastest or swim the farthest? How do you think that competition is going to be resolved <laughs> when their survival is dependent on it? Exactly. Yeah. You know, something, I think it was two years ago, I'm watching the NCAA Women's Tournament. And on ESPN, so they go, they're showing the locker room speeches. And the game was Maryland versus Tennessee. And I'm listening to the coaches, and the last thing the University of Maryland coach says to her team is, play your best, and they will remember us. The Tennessee coach, I couldn't believe I was hearing this, says, I want you to go out there and rip their hearts out. What a crazy message. And I will tell you, Maryland won. So when you say this competition, one of the worst things an athlete can do, like if you're coaching a soccer team and they have a big game, one of the worst things they can do is, is have the mindset that they have to beat the other team. They might not be good enough to beat the other team. If both teams play their best, your team's losing. That's the bottom line. So the best they can do is the best, and that should always be the message. Just do your best. And if you do your best every single day, good things happen. I've never seen an athlete feel badly about him or herself when they lose if they play their best. They only get upset when they perform below their capability. There is no shame in losing when you when you've done your best. A, a a student can come home and say, you know what, I did great on my SATs. They're still not getting into Harvard. That doesn't mean they right. choked. It just means right. they weren't good enough. The the um, the shame would be is if the pressure got to them and they performed below their capabilities. So I said the message should be to all athletes, and this is what elite athletes do, 
their message is they focus on doing their best, not on beating the other person. Uh, Serena Williams said every time she plays a tennis part, Every time she plays a tennis tournament, her mission is always the same, to play her best. And usually, her best is good enough. Yeah, I, I think that we've, it's a, an epidemic. We've got a competition epidemic here, in, uh, certainly in the United States. I mean, and you're telling me it's in China, I'm some, and I think that the world is trying to catch up to us in that respect. And uh, I think if they've learned anything from just watching our sports, our national teams in a variety of different ways, they would they would say that, you know, the competition doesn't make us better. And I just remember reading a book called No Contest by, uh, by Alfie Cohn. He, he, he was a former psychology editor of Psychology Today. Wow. And I agree with you as he showed that what cooperation – great book yeah that cooperation right. is what brings out the best non-competition yeah. and also think of the mindset that when kids are competitive you know one of the things i told my kids there's always going to be somebody smarter there's always going to be somebody better looking there's always going to be somebody richer so what's the point of always trying to be the best when i lived in la i did a lot of therapy and i always say if you live in los angeles you have to do therapy but i was <laughs> licensed to do it and I used to see a lot of successful, very competitive people. And I always say they were so successful they could afford to come to therapy twice a week. Because when you have a competitive mindset, you're on a treadmill. You're always trying to be number one, but there's always going to be somebody better. So what's the, it, it makes no sense. And, and these people, I will tell you, they, uh, they, they become the type A personalities there is no correlation between a type A personality and success, but there is a very high correlation between a type A personality and poor health. Now, back in the day, you know, when we were caveman, it was good to have a, to be number one. You got the best meat. You, you got the choice of the female. So that worked out very well. But as society evolved, no longer did you have to be number one to have a place in society. You just had to do something that contributed to the group. Thus, cooperation started to uh, evolve. So I, there's two types of mindsets. One is a ranking mindset where you're basing what you do on um, what everybody else is doing. And there is an excellent mindset, which simply means that you are focusing on being the best you can. I remember growing up, my father always used to tell me, don't worry about the other guy. You can't control what the other person does. So just take care of yourself. And when you focus on being your best, you reduce those daily feelings of pressure that I find uh, most people experience almost 24-7. Right. I mean, I think back to some of the stories that I've read in, uh, in Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich and the Law of Success and the Science of Personal Achievement. He talks about, he talks about a guy like uh, Thomas Edison. Now, I think when he probably sat down, I don't think he's, he's not competing against anybody, right? Because I, I think competition and creativity can't go together. Well, they don't go together very well, and it kind of chokes off that part of my mind that allows me to be innovative, creative, a thinking kind of individual, solving things, creating good works of great books or music or art or who knows what it is. So uh, what kind of things here, what, what kind of immediate things listen, can listeners do here to manage some of this pressure? Well, one of the things that I have found is, you know, in the book we have like 22 what I call precious solutions. And you know how it is because you just had your book come out. So if you were actually starting to write your book today, it would probably be very different than how you started writing it two years ago because of all the personal learning that you have developed since then. So one of the things that I have uh, seen is that there is a particular mindset that people hold um, – that allow them to perform consistently at their best level, which, remember, might not be good enough, but at least it is their best, and to minimize the effects of pressure. So I want listeners to realize 
is that you're not rising to the occasion. I used to think the edge was rising to the occasion. The edge is not succumbing to the negative effects of pressure. So there are some uh, general ways of thinking that really help. For example, you have to be positive. You have to approach a pressure moment um, with a positive mindset, meaning do you see do you see it as threatening or do you see it as an opportunity or as a challenge? There will be some kids playing soccer who that if they have to kick the penalty kick, they get really nervous because they see it as threatening. They think, gee, if I miss this, all the other kids are going to laugh at me, I'll be a loser, and so on. There are other kids who see it as a great opportunity and as a challenge, and they see it as being fun. But Braun James does not even use the word pressure. He just uses the word challenge and opportunity. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that you can start to create that positive mindset is to use the words challenge and opportunity anytime you go in a pressure moment. I would tell my son or daughter, think of the test as an opportunity to show the teacher what you know. Think of the mm-hmm. interview as an opportunity to show the person how good you how good you are. When something is hard, it's just a it's just a challenge. And the reason that is important is because when you have a positive mindset, you approach the situation with confidence rather than trepidation. So I have found that the biggest differentiator between people who do their best versus people who choke is this. Do you see a pressure moment threatening or do you see it as an opportunity? A second very important point is to, and this is counterintuitive, but it's to uh, shrink the importance of the situation. The worst thing a coach can tell a player or his team is this is really an important game. I want the game of the season, be... or or this is right. how this is you know this is this is where they got us last time, or anything the, in the future or in the past doesn't allow me to really enjoy the moment right now. And that's exactly, and we'll get to that because it's very important to stay in the moment, but very few people tell the person how to stay in the moment, which we will get to. But the point here is to, the more important you make a situation, the more pressure you are creating. The more important you say the SATs are, the more pressure you're putting on your son or daughter. Joe Flacco, before he won the Super Bowl, the day before he won the Super Bowl with Baltimore, he was asked, how do you deal with the pressure of the Super Bowl? And his response was, uh, it's just another game. And the media hates that because they're thinking, how could it just be another game? It's the Super Bowl. But the reality is that's how elite athletes think. That's why they tend to stay uh, you know, calm and keep their composure. So it's minimizing the importance of the situation. When I first gave my first presentation at UCLA when I was 30, I was really nervous, of course, because I was telling myself, this is really important, and if I'm not good, they'll never have me back again, and and so on. Now, my attitude is, uh, it's just another presentation. It's no big deal. A third part of the mindset is to always think in multiple opportunities. One of the things that pressure does is that it attacks our thinking. You know, our human performance system is based on an interaction. Visualize a triangle where one point of the triangle is your thoughts, another point is your behavior, and another is your physical arousal. And what pressure does, it attacks each one of those components. And one of the ways it attacks your thoughts is that it creates pressure distortions where you exaggerate the significance of the situation and you think of chance of a lifetime thinking. This is the only chance I'm ever going to have. I mean, come on, think back to how many important tests you had in high school. You can't even remember all the, quote, important tests. Uh, If you miss a train, big deal, there's another one coming. So I like to teach people, and I find this very useful to myself, to always think in multiple opportunities. There's always going to be another chance. And as long as you know there's going to be another chance, you feel less pressure. I was giving a presentation one time in uh, Montreal 
to 500 financial advisors. And one young guy jumps up, that's been about 24, 25, and he says, well, how do you deal with the pressure of uh, asking a girl out that you really like? You know, for me, that's a lot of pressure, he would say. Before I could even respond, another gentleman jumps up a few years older, and he says, just remember there's a thousand other girls waiting for the same phone call. Everybody laughed, but everybody also knew it was true. So always thinking in multiple opportunities, being positive, think of the pressure moment, build these words into your vocabulary, into your thinking, challenge and opportunity, minimize the important, and also, very importantly, only focus on what you can control. A lot of people get thrown off course because they start worrying about things that they cannot control. Why is an athlete worrying about the weather? whether it rains or snows or whatever, that's out of his control. And if you're thinking about the weather, you cannot be thinking about doing your best. You made a really important comment, you know, of people being in the future or the past. The future is where anxiety is. And every pressure moment there's anxiety, uncertainty. If you're watching a soccer game, and it could be the World Cup, and if your team is winning by 10 goals and there's two minutes to left, you don't even have to watch the last two minutes. There's no pressure. It's already decided. But if it's 1-1, we are all on the edge of our seats. So when you think about in, the reason we get anxious is we're thinking about the future. What is going to happen if I don't do well? And if you start thinking about what is going to happen if you don't do well, how can you be focusing again on what you're supposed to be doing in the moment. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And I just, I think back to, you know, my early days of coaching and how much different it is from the coaching that I, that I do today with the young kids. You know, I think, uh, you know, I think it was once I started to really try to drill a message into a young person that, Hey, look, the only person you're trying to be better than is the person you were yesterday. And and when and when they understand this over and over and they get the repetition of a of a statement that can really make an impact in their life, they the kids know the truth. And this is another thing that I've kind of come to understand is that when these young kids start to put the information in their mind over and over and over again, they get what Emerson says, you and I become what we think about all day long. And you're trying to say, hey, look, here's how, here's better ways to stay positive, to stay upbeat, to always be looking for opportunities, to min- not, and to minimize the outcome of the result. All I can do is do the work that I can do today, and the result will really take care of itself in many different ways. Exactly. That's where the pressure comes off of me. Exactly. You know, that reminds me, I remember when my son, he must have been about eight years old playing in a Little League game. And the situation arose where he was the key batter, like in the last inning, you know, with a chance to tie the game or go ahead. So I'm sitting in the crowd, and I see the coach calls him over, puts his arm around him, whispers something. And then he goes up to bat, and he actually gets a hit. And and he was so overwhelmed by that, everybody had to tell him to run because he just, like, froze. (laughs) So then after the game, I said to him, Danny, I'm really interested. What did your coach say to you? And the coach says, oh, he said, it's all up to you. We're all counting on you. Everything's up to you. This is the worst thing a coach could have said. All he really needed to say is go up, have fun, do your best, uh, and take a deep breath. And that would have been a much better message. So despite that, you know, he still got a hit, but that was the worst possible thing a coach could say. It's like parents who say to their kids, okay, we'll be sitting in the eighth row and rooting for you. We know uh, you won't let us down. Uh, Make us proud of you. Now, that actually, they're trying to be supportive, but they're actually putting more pressure on the kid. And I always say to parents, how would you like it if your son came home from school and said, Dad, listen, you got to work harder because I'm sick and tired of being driven to school in that lousy Prius. You have to make more money so you can get an AMG Mercedes like the other kids' fathers have. Make me proud of you. Or if the daughter said, Mom, 
you got to go to the gym and knock off 20 pounds. You're the fattest mother of them all. It's embarrassing. Make me proud of you. Yeah. But parents do that to their kids all the time. Right. And I have found, you know, my favorite role, I have to tell you, is being a father. And I found the best message that I could give my kids and that I recommend to other parents. That's what my father gave to me, is that I trust you to succeed. I trust you to succeed. And that really made me, gave me a sense of, uh, of confidence. Remember, confidence is the enemy of pressure. You don't, when you're confident, you feel less pressure. That is why the best way when you're saying what people can do, you know, if it's a presentation or a sporting uh, event, practice, practice, practice is the best thing. There is no prodigy. You know, show me a kid who's seven years old that can play, you know, uh, a terrific piano recital, and I will show you a kid whose parents make him practice eight hours a day. Mm -hmm. He didn't wake up one day and sit at the piano and just play. Right. I think we got that, you know, uh, I think I was listening to, I don't know if it was Bob Proctor or Napoleon Hill, and he, they were, they were talking about, um, and I just think it was, uh, you know, what kind of things can I be doing here to, to, you know, to, to practice or, or to get better? And he said that very few people master anything. And I was just yeah. like, kind of, you know, I'm like, what? Is that I'm like, that can't be true. And then with, upon further review and evaluation and understanding, you find that it is true, right? Very few people put the time in to do the thing that they want to do and do it really at a high level. Exactly. Do you agree with that statement? Yeah, I, I do agree with that statement that the um, you, you're not going to be great. It's like balance. People always say, you know, you have to have life balance, uh, but yet, the irony is very few successful people have a balanced life. You know when they have a balanced life? After they've made their fame and fortune and they can relax. I can assure you that Peyton Manning and Tom Brady did not have a balanced life because they're in the room watching game films, you know, 15 hours a day every single, uh, every single day. That it takes a lot of hard work. And, and unfortunately... Uh, many people don't want to do the hard work, so then they get into a pressure situation and they think it's it's just going to happen automatically. And they think then if they, quote, screw up, uh, they choke. The reality is they didn't choke. They weren't prepared. Try to take a chemistry test without studying and without knowing the formulas. You didn't choke. If you didn't study, how could you possibly even think you would know the answers? (laughs) And it's true. Right. It's true. And, and, and I find this whole, you know, one, one of the things that I find clinically is that a lot of people are, experience what I call pressure anxiety. And pressure anxiety is the continual feeling. It's perpetual. You're feeling it every single day that you have to produce. It's like you're carrying a burden and you can't put it down. You know, carrying a, a boulder on your shoulders. And you're always wondering, how much longer can I carry this? And you're afraid that if you put it down, there will be dire types of consequences. Now, I am 67. I have found that there are some people, what I call, like my son and daughter, pressure performers. That means that in every situation they're in, whether it's a presentation, an interview, they want to do their best because every success leads them to something else. Just like when I was in my 30s and my 40s, every time a good presentation would lead to another one. And a bad presentation would be pressure because that could, you know, knock me out. Well, now there are other groups of people. I find these are people usually that are over 50 years old that they experience a different type of pressure. And that is where this pressure anxiety fits in. Like my friends who are lawyers, none of them feel nervous when they walk into a courtroom. The pressure they're feeling is, how much longer do I have to pay for my daughter's apartment? When will I be finished with that? That's the pressure that they feel. So they're going to bed every night thinking about how much longer do I have to do this and how much longer can I do it? 
that's a very different type of feeling. And that's when, when people say they feel like they're in a pressure cooker. It's relentless. And because the country and the world is becoming more competitive, Right. That's going to become more and more prevalent. That feeling. And just think about the, you know, the very the few people that are able to do that. And I don't want to say perform under pressure because pressure is a is a word that we use to define the feelings that I cause myself. Right. Well, yeah. Well, sometimes I mean, you know, if, if uh, you know you're coaching and a sponsor comes up and they say, look. This, this has been a lot of fun, but if the team does not win this game, uh, there's no more sponsorship, and therefore the team is is gone. You're going to feel pressure, meaning that you have to produce a specific response. See, one of the things I found is that people really confuse pressure and stress. When I was first writing this book, oh, I'm writing a book on pressure, I would say that 98% of the time, the very first question is, how is that different than stress? And, mm-hmm. and let me differentiate a, a tip. You know, if you're in a situation, ask yourself, am I feeling overwhelmed or do I feel I have to produce a response? And if you're just feeling overwhelmed, most likely that is a stressful situation. A, a stressful situation is when you have too many demands made upon you and not enough resources to respond. Too many bills, not enough cash, will create financial stress. But there's many ways you can deal with that. You can prioritize your bills. You can pay them late. You can borrow money. You can get an extra job, whatever. A pressure situation is when there's only one way to handle the situation, and that is you have to respond effectively. When you're landing a plane on the Hudson River, yes, you have to relax but you still have to make the landing. A quarterback still has to relax himself in a pressure situation, but the bottom line is he still has to throw the pass. Uh, Where in a stressful situation, all you need to do is relax and just like to feel better. So, And when people confuse the two, where they treat every stressful situation as a do-or-die moment, they are living on high alert 24-7. And that's when you hear the person come home and say, oh, I'm so exhausted, you know, from work. It was a hard day. Yeah, because they make every situation a do-or-die. And every situation is not a do-or-die pressure situation. That's a fantastic distinction. So, doctor, let me, let me ask you a question here. Why, why do parents put too much pressure on their kids? I think a lot of it has to come out with their own needs. You know, I grew up in Great Neck, Long Island, which is a um, very competitive, affluent community. And maybe you remember, I'm sure some of the listeners do, that about two years ago, maybe three, they had a big cheating scandal. And where seven kids from the high school I went to hired another student to take uh, their SATs for them, and when I heard that, I laughed to myself. I said, you know what? I know those kids. Their parents are the ones who have bumper stickers, Harvard, Princeton, and Yale on the back of their car. Mm-hmm. So many times, I used to see this in L.A. The, uh, when, I lived, when I lived there, many times, parents put pressure on their kids because it's out of their own need. You know, let's face it. Do you think when Tiger Woods was three years old, he said to his father, I want to play golf? No. Of course not. His father had a golf club in him, you know, like the the stage mother who makes their kid be an actress so she can, you know, live off off the glamour. Imagine the life that Tiger had to live. He never really had a normal life as a kid. He had tennis. He had to play golf. We don't even really know if he ever loved golf. This is what he was conditioned to do. So and many times that comes out of the parents. It comes out of the parents' needs. So that's why I said earlier, parents inadvertently put pressure on their kids even when they think they're trying to be supportive. So one is is when you want your kids to do something, a lot of times it comes out because it makes the parent feel good and look makes them look good to their friends. The first thing 
a parent does when their son or daughter gets to Yale or Harvard or any elite school, you know, or makes the uh, becomes an All American in sports, is they call their friends to brag, as if as if they did it. This is what is so amusing to me that when people say congratulations to the parents with the kid graduated, you know what I learned to say? I say congratulate your son for me. Congratulate your daughter. Why am I congratulating the parents? They didn't go to school. The kid did. Right. So I think that's one reason. And sometimes inadvertently we put pressure on kids when we're trying to be supportive. For example, the mother or father who says, do well on this math test and I'll get you that new iPod. Now, as soon yeah. as the mother or father go out of the room, the kid really wants that iPod. He, now he makes a little crib sheet because he really wants that. So this is why sometimes when we use incentives, it puts more pressure on the person, even though we think we're motivating them. This is what happens many times in the financial world, you know, in, in companies. Is the incentives become so big, it forces the person to do something that maybe goes against their ethics. And also, if you're also thinking about the incentive, you know, winning, it's like an athlete thinking about holding up the trophy before he won the game. Well, while you're daydreaming about holding up the trophy, the other team scores a touchdown. Or the goalie is now thinking about, you know, the party afterwards, and the next thing you know is the ball rolls right by him or her into the net for the winning for the winning goal. So or, it goes through, or the ball goes through the English goalkeeper's legs into the goal in a World Cup. Yeah. Match. <laughs> you know, that's when you hear, what, what were you thinking about? Well, they weren't <laughs> thinking about blocking the kick. They were thinking about, uh, you know, how sweet it will be when they win. Right. And, and one so of the ways that people can remember to stay in the moment is to tune into their senses. See, if you tune into your senses, what are you actually seeing? You know, kids need to remember and focus on their teammates, who they're looking at, the smell of the air. That keeps you in the moment rather than having your mind wander and regulating your breathing. A lot of people feel in a pressure situation, especially when something unexpected happens. They get thrown off course. You know, you hear the, the, he's lost his composure. It's when the golfer makes a bad shot and 10 bad shots in a row, can never, he can never recover. One of the fastest ways that you can regain control is to regulate your breathing because it puts you in control of your body immediately. This is why they will teach SWAT officers to breathe in short, um, to have, you know, four short breaths. And, and, and now they're in control. And then they can start to focus and perform much more effectively. So that's like a, another good little pressure solution. People, the coach should say, listen, before we kick off, uh, look at the crowd, appreciate where you are. Golfers, I would tell, as they're walking up the fairway, to appreciate the crowd and the beauty of the golf course. If you're appreciating the beauty of the golf course, you can't be thinking about the contract uh, with Nike that you might blow if you miss you know, uh, uh, the last hole. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Dr. Weisinger, so where do you th where do you think you are in in the ten thousand hour rule? The ten thousand hours to master your craft. I mean, I would imagine that you probably have probably well past that. Well, you know, it depends. I would say talking on the subject of criticism and emotional intelligence, um, I may be at the twenty thousand hour level. Uh, talking about pressure, as many of your listeners can probably figure out. I'm at the uh, three or four thousand hour level. If we do this interview a year from now, it will be much better. You know, the more you talk about something, the more you understand it, the more fluid it becomes, and that's part of the exciting part. Is you know always thinking in terms of getting uh, you know getting better and getting better and getting better, and that's what I like to um, focus on. So if you were to give some advice to a young person who wants to, I don't know, do something spectacular in their life, it doesn't matter whether they're 10 years old, 12, 14, 
what would you tell them that would allow them to kind of go inside and, and, and focus in on the qualities that they're kind of bringing to the table? And at the same here's time, what I would tell me, here's what I would tell young people. And I tell all of us this too. It's just as important for the 70 year old as it is for the 15th year old. If that is to have worthy goals, to have a purpose, mm-hmm. that this is why many kids are motivated because other people are setting their goals. So I would tell all young people is what is a worthy goal for you? What is it really is really meaningful? Remember, the first goal of man was to find food. Nobody had to say, get out of bed and find some food. You had to. Your, your own physiology demanded it. But when you are 13, 14 years old, it's very difficult to have long-term goals because you have to stay motivated for all those years. And one of the ways you can always rekindle your motivation is to remember what your purpose is, what your mission is. And the way you make that concrete is by having a goal that you want to accomplish that you feel is really worthy of of yourself, really meaningful. And once you have that goal, then you can start to break it down into short steps. You know, I had a point where my worthy goal is I wanted to write a a book that would really be successful and contribute a lot. Well, okay, that's the goal. Step one is I got to know what I'm talking about. So I have to educate myself. Step two is, well, now I have to actually write it. I mean, you know the process. Step three is now you have to come up with the title, and then you have to sell it and so on. But I would always remember, you know, what the big goal was. And it's a way of keeping your enthusiasm. It's very important to be enthusiastic. You know, I'd say the the attributes that I think all young people, everybody wants to instill in themselves, it's what I call your coat of armor, C-O-T-E, confidence, optimism, tenacity, and enthusiasm. Now, nobody invented those. Nobody invented confidence. Nobody invented optimism or tenacity or enthusiasm. These are attributes that evolved over time because they give us an edge. They help us deal with life's adversities. That is true for today, and it was true 10,000 years ago. Uh, One of the interesting things is if I said to you, look, I want you to go on a height program so you can grow another five inches, you can't do that. Your height is already fixed. You can't change your, your height. But you can still change your confidence level. You can still change your enthusiasm level. Those are, those are what psychologists call open systems, meaning they can still develop. And the reason they can still develop is because they are still useful. It doesn't matter whether you are six years old, 30, or 60. If you are confident, you have an edge. The same is true for those other attributes. So I would recommend that people, an exercise I like to give people, is that if you met a 30-year-old and they were really confident, what type of life experiences do you think they had that get them into that confidence zone where they are now? What would be their life experiences? And that's sort of how I created a blueprint for creating um, those attributes, instilling them in yourself. That was the question I asked. And then you start to work backwards. And I will tell you one is confident people had, for the most part, had supportive parents. A a characteristic of people with low self-esteem is that they did not have supportive parents. A characteristic of individuals who have high self-esteem is that they had supportive parents and that they had a lot of success experiences. One of the, nothing succeeds like success. So, you know, I would say to a soccer, a five-year-old soccer player, the success is not scoring a goal. That's not the success. That might never happen. The success is kicking the ball. Every time he kicks the ball, hey, you did it. And that's how you start to breed confidence. Don't wait for successes to come to you, is my message. Create successes. I would tell my son and daughter, I said, listen, when you have an interview for your first job, getting the job, that is not the goal. The goal is having a good interview. Because if you have good interviews, then it's a numbers game. Then it's just a matter of time before you get a job. 
So don't focus on getting the job because that creates pressure. Focus on just having a good interview. So even if you don't get the job but you had a great interview, that's a success. And I call these micro successes. And it's these little successes that actually change um, the makings, the workings of our brain, and they make us feel more confident. Uh, Another smart strategy is to teach your kids whenever they play soccer to walk like a champ. Mm -hmm. Your posture impacts your internal feelings. This is why a Marine sergeant 100 years ago said, stand up straight. Yeah, because when you stand up straight, you feel better. You're more confident. Mm -hmm. Remember, those cavemen who stood up straight increased their reach to pick fruit off a tree versus the ones who were always slumped over. Everybody listening will remember that their mother told them when they were eight years old, sit up in your chair and so on. That was really really good advice. You actually feel better. So I would say before that seven-year-old has their penalty kick and they're feeling pressure, as a coach, you want them to walk around for like one minute in a really confident posture. And and then they'll start to feel more confident. Then they're ready for their kick. That's fantastic. Dr. Weissinger, we're running out of time here. How can our listeners download a copy of your book, buy a copy of your book? Where can they find it? Where can they find well, out more they about it? find you? it. I like to tell people, because I'm very cost-sensitive uh, to, you know, everybody's financial uh, issues, uh, I like to tell people to get it on Amazon because that is the best deal. And I'd like people to follow me uh, at Pressure Tweets, you know, on Twitter or go to my Facebook page, Dr. Henry Weisinger, and they will see a lot of articles for free, a lot of radio, TV interviews for free. It's just good information. And I will also, as you mentioned earlier, be... Uh, launching uh, in the late fall a online uh, course, an e-course of uh, performing under pressure that is going to be just great. It's going to be great production, lots of exercises, a pressure chat room to share experiences, lots of uh, downloads, I think, and you can do it, of course, at your own uh, speed. And I think it's going to be very, very valuable and it's going to help a lot of people. Well, it's hard to, uh, it's tough to believe that we've actually gone through uh, almost an hour's worth of time talking about uh, the things that uh, solve pressure, identify pressure, and how we, what we can do about it. But this has been an absolutely tremendous, uh, tremendous time. So uh, one more time, uh, Dr. Weiss here, what was the Twitter, Twitter handle? Uh, at Pressure Tweets. At Pressure Tweets. And what I'm going to do for our listeners is we're going to put all their contact information on the message that we we send out to all of our uh, listeners and affiliates so that they can uh, easily find you about uh, about your book. Great. So, Appreciate it. This has been a great hour. Thank you very much, Dr. Weisinger. Hey, and thanks for having me. We're going to wrap this up here with Journey to Success Radio. And have yeah, a great and you know what my final message to everybody is? Tell us. May the... May the pressure not be with you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you very much, Doctor. And we're going to have to have you back here because obviously an hour is not enough of our time together. Thank you. Have, I enjoy have it. A, have, have a great evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Journey to Success Radio. If you or anyone you know well, would like to be interviewed for the show, email Tom at tomtutall.com for details.